Okay, hi and welcome everybody. This is Giselle Hamilton, equine naturopath and founder of Sacred Horse. And for those of you on here live tonight, thank you so much for joining us. Our topic this evening is stable gardens and herbal teas. And this topic has been something that is so popular at the moment. I think I get more questions about stable gardens um, and people being able to um, plant their own stable gardens than I do just about anything else in my naturopathy practice. Um, so definitely a popular topic at the moment. And what I'm hoping for our presentation tonight is that you get some really practical takeaways so that you can go away and plant your own garden and start using some of your own remedies. And to do that, I'm going to run through with you nine plants in particular to get your garden started, explaining to you how those plants work, how to harvest them, and then giving you some remedies to start using with your horses. So what we're going to run through tonight, um, I'm going to start off just talking about some cautions, some things to keep in mind before you start planting. We're going to look at two different types of herb gardens so that you can work out what works best for you and your individual scenario. Then we'll look at the nine plants that I recommend that you can plant now to get the garden started. We'll look at harvest and preparation, and then I'll give you just a few herbal remedies to get started with your garden so that you don't just plant some lovely herbs and then do nothing with them. It's going to be very practical and very useful for you. Okay, so to start off with, the cautions before you plant, just some food for thought. Um, so what I want you to be really careful of in the first instance is false herbs. Don't automatically assume that you know what the plants are in your paddock and make sure that you have identified them correctly. Now, there are some herbs out there which um, you are very confident in and you know what the plant is and that's perfectly fine. But we need to keep in mind that if you incorrectly identify a herb in your paddock and then go to transplant it into your herb garden or stable garden, it can be toxic to your horse. Um, some examples of this um, in the first instance is there are a number of varieties of false chamomile. So these are plants in the daisy family. They look a lot like your medicinal chamomile, but they're not. Um, and they can cause some bleeding and some slow clotting. Um, so with chamomile in particular, what I would suggest to you is if you've got some out in your paddock and you think it's chamomile, please don't transplant it. That's one I would recommend that you actually go to a herbal supplier or go to the local garden supply and double check the scientific name, make sure you've got the correct chamomile. I'm hearing lots of reports of people saying that they've given their horse chamomile and that there's been some bleeding um, internally but what's actually happening is people are giving them what they think is chamomile that they've picked from the paddock, okay? So just be very careful there. Another example is um, fennel. Uh, there's a lot of wild fennel that grows out, um, but it can be confused with poison hemlock, um, which as you can tell by the name, is not so healthy for your horse. Um, if you were to have a look at some pictures online, you would actually see that the leaves of your poison hemlock versus your fennel are quite different, but people have historically accidentally mistaken them. So as long as you identify the fennel correctly, that's, for example, something you can use. So that's why I'm just saying be very careful. If you are 100% confident that you know what the herb is, you know, you can use it if that if you feel comfortable to do that but if you want to be 100% certain you're better off going to um, your herbal supplier or your nursery close to home. The other thing that you need to keep in mind are herbs in sport. So herbs are nature's drugs and most of our pharmaceuticals nowadays have actually been derived from plant medicine where they've taken the plant, identified the main chemical constituent that is believed to um, you know, produce the result that we want medicinally and then turned into a drug. Um, now, each regulatory sport body has its own rules pertaining to drug regulation. So it is your responsibility to check with your regulating body before giving herbs 
or talking to your veterinarian because I know that with some sports there are you know you'll find that there's a holding period where you know if the horse is unwell or if the horse has an injury you can give herbs and then you need a holding period of x number of days or x number of weeks before you can go back into competition okay um, the Australian Sport and Drugs Association will not allow um, any support personnel or any therapists to give advice on herbs and supplements so I can't give you that advice that's why I recommend that you actually um, check with your regulatory body and potentially talk to a veterinarian before you give any herbs if you are competing okay so they're my main two things just to start with just as food for thought before you do anything further with the herbs and now what we're going to do is have a bit of a chat about the herb garden types just to give you some ideas about what you can do so there are two main types of garden. Your first one is a stable garden and the first, the second is a cottage garden. Now, usually in stable gardens, you've planted them where you keep your horses. So they're um, at the stable around the facilities. And usually, but not always, horses have free access to pick at the herbs. And they're you know a little bit like dogs when they're sick and cats, they'll go to grass and they'll eat it uh, if they're not feeling well and they'll either start to feel better or they'll vomit. With horses, they've got, um, to some extent, the same sort of idea about they will pick out particular herbs that they need at particular times. And that's sort of the idea behind your stable garden. That being said, you can always have a garden um, at the stables and not allow the horses, the horses free access, and you can actually harvest the herbs yourself if that's what you want to do. So you've got a couple of options there. The second, uh, the second garden option is a pottage garden. And this is, let's say you aren't able to plant a stable garden um, at, over at the stables. You can plant your herbs at home and obviously dual purpose. You can use them yourself medicinally, um, making herbal teas for culinary purposes. Um, so what you can do here is you can either have a specific um, herb plot or you can plant your herbs in amongst your other flowering plants and so forth so that they're all mixed in. Another option for you to consider, which I um, have spoken about previously in um, some talks that I've done, are uh, hanging baskets for inner stables. So if you can't plant a stable garden and maybe you don't have a lot of room at home, you can actually put herbs into a hanging basket in the stable for the horses to pick at and free graze upon. Um, if you do this though, what I would recommend is having a couple of baskets made up because you're going to need to rotate them so the horses don't eat them to death and then you've got nothing left. So they're your options to get going. So you can start having a think about how you individually want to do that based upon your circumstances. All right, this is the fun bit. This is what to plant and why we're planting it. So these are our nine herbs that we're going to run through. Um, for you to plant in your garden and get you started. Obviously, over time, you can build on this repertoire, you can grow the garden, but this is a really simple starting point so that you're not overwhelmed by ideas of planting too much. So the first herb here, a very simple herb, but a very effective herb is chamomile. Now this is the one I said before, unless you are 100% positive that you are giving one of the two uh, chamomiles I've got listed here, um, you need to go and buy them. And what I want you to actually do is when you're looking at a plant at a nursery, is have a look at their scientific name because there are different varieties of the same plant. Um, now, what I've got listed here are the German and the Roman chamomile, and these are the ones um, that you are wanting to try to purchase, one or the other. So they're the Matricaria chamomilla and the Chamomellum nobile. Um, there is a lot of talk, I sort of touched on before, there's so much talk on the internet at the moment about, oh, be careful with chamomile, it can cause bleeding. But I have scoured every herbal text, I have scoured veterinary herbal texts, I have looked online at studies and journal articles, and there is absolutely no evidence to support this. Um, there are individuals, and so hence it's also possible in horses, who have a reaction 
to plants in the daisy family and chamomile is a plant in the daisy family. So there is always a chance that if your horse has reactions around daisy-like plants, whether it be hives or allergies or something else like that, chamomile might not be suitable for them. Um, and obviously, if you are allowing your horse to access huge volumes of chamomile, yes, it can cause side effects in the same way that if you eat too much of anything, it can cause side effects. You know, if you ate a huge volume of sugar, it can be toxic to you. Same with these herbs. So obviously just don't overdo anything. Don't let your horse gorge and eat a whole plant of chamomile. Um, just be, you know, uh, a little bit thoughtful about their way they're eating it. And the other thing to consider with this chamomile um, concern is a lot of horses are getting access to these false chamomiles. They're not the correct medicinal chamomile. And obviously there is very well documented evidence that these false chamomiles do cause bleeding. I think what's happened from what I have seen online is there's one person who's got online and said chamomile can cause bleeding and everyone else has gone off and quoted it and now everyone's talking about it like it's fact when it's actually not scientifically fact, okay? The chamomile itself, the parts you use are just the flowers. Now, if your horse has a little bit of a nibble and they eat more than the flowers, if they're free grazing on it, don't stress, it will be fine. Um, but in terms of the medicinal value, we tend um, to use just the flower heads themselves. And what we do here is they can use them fresh or you can make them into an infusion. And I'm going to explain later on um, what the terms infusion and decoction mean and how you um, actually make the preparations if they're not free grazing. So don't stress on that too much now, we'll come back to that. Um, the uses for chamomile, I could go on and on and on, but I've just kept it very simple. Chamomile is a very versatile plant. Um, it is very useful for stress and anxiety. So if you've got a very nervy horse, um, this is fabulous for them. Um, it's also very good for digestive problems, um, horses who tend to be colicky, horses with stomach ulcers, and also horses that are scouring or have diarrhea. So really great for digestion. If you've got a horse then that has stress and anxiety and associated digestive problems such as ulcers, this is a lovely plant because it helps to keep them calm and ease their digestion. Also really good for horses who have poor appetite. Externally, you can um, make an infusion and it can be used as an eye wash. You'd only do this fresh. You wouldn't keep the, you know, make up an infusion and keep it for days. You can make a fresh eye wash for horses where they've just got a bit of inflammation or they need a washout. And you can also use it to wash over wounds and any skin inflammation because it is very calming. So lovely herb there, chamomile, and quite easy to get your hands on. The next plant that I recommend you plant is dill. Um, scientific name is up there um, and you will get access to the replay. So you, you can write these down or you can just wait and check the replay out later. The parts of the dill that we use medicinally is actually the seed, but horses free grazing can eat the dill. You can use the dill in cooking, uh, like the leaves themselves, absolutely not a problem. It's just the seed has higher medicinal value, hence why in herbalism we use the seed, but you can actually use a lot of it. This is commonly used for colic and it's also good for poor milk production. Um, the reason I've added dill in is because it is a very, very safe herb that can even be used in foals. Or better still, if you give it to the mare while she is lactating, um, the benefits of the dew will go through into her milk and ease digestion if you've got a foal who's just a little bit off. And this one, um, like I said, they can eat the leaves fresh, but the seeds themselves you will prepare as an, an infusion. Echinacea. Now this one, if you're in Australia, you're not going to be able to get your hands on it at your local Bunnings or your hardware store. You're actually going to need to go to a specialist herbal supplier or you can go online and you can order seed relatively easily. Echinacea is hands down one of my absolute favourite herbs because it is so effective and there are countless studies um, that show the effects of echinacea. There are two varieties that you can get your hands on, the Echinacea purpurea and the Echinacea angustifolia. Both are perfectly fine. A lot of the preparations you find are a combination of the two. 
Um, the parts that you use are the flowers and the roots. Now, obviously, if your horse is free grazing, they can't get access to the roots because they're not going to dig up the plant, but they can happily eat the flower head. Um, the, obviously, harvesting the root involves a little bit more than cutting off a flower head, so up to you whether you want to, to do that or not. Um, whatever you do, it's best served fresh, although you can um, certainly dry the echinacea as well. Now, what we're using echinacea for primarily is for the immune system and for microbial infections. So vir viruses, bacterial infections, really, really highly effective. Studies have shown that echinacea can actually kill most bacteria and most viruses. Viruses are a little bit tricky in that um, they can hide in cells. So they will actually um, inhabit a cell, take it over, reproduce and sort of burst out of the cell. Once the virus has burst out of the cell, the echinacea can, in the body can then do its work to help destroy the virus. Um, so this one is definitely one that you want to get your hands on. It's also an immune modulator, which means if your immune system is a bit sluggish, it improves your immune function. If your immune function is a little bit high and your body's overdoing it, it helps to settle it back down. It's also what we call as herbalists a blood cleanser. Um, and what it effectively does is if your blood is a little bit toxic, uh, a little bit sluggish, things aren't working too well, it just helps to give the blood a bit of a clean out from anything that shouldn't be in there. It's useful for digestive ulcers, and it's also really good for hay fever. If you have a horse that in the springtime um, starts to get a bit hay fevery, and it does happen, um, echinacea is really useful. Just note with echinacea that when you're using it, use it for six weeks on and then two weeks off. It's not really meant as a long-term herb 52 weeks of the year. And the reason why is there's some concern that your body will get lazy if the echinacea is doing the work for it. So if they do need it a little bit long term, say over three months, just six weeks on, two weeks off, six weeks on again, okay? And the preparation here is a decoction of the roots, feed them with the fresh flowers, or you can do an infusion of the flowers. Okay, so the next one is lemon balm. And this is another versatile little herb that I absolutely love. Scientific name is Melissa officinalis, and the parts we're using here are the aerial plant part, so the leaves and the flowers and the stem, all fine. Just like chamomile, this one is really good for digestive upsets and stomach ulcers, and also stress and anxiety. So it's really great for horses that are a little bit nervy and have the stomach ulcers and the digestive upsets. It just helps to calm them down. It helps to deal with any nerve pain that they might be having. Um, it also has some effect on um, microbial infections, your viruses and your bacterial infections. Um, it helps with parasites. So I'm talking about worms here. It can actually help with a, to get rid of a worm burden. And it helps with circulation and heart health. It makes sure that you don't have any blood, high blood pressure, that everything is just ticking over as it should. So as you can see from this one here, the stressed out horse with stomach problems, um, you know, potentially a bit of a high pulse, high heart rate, really, really good for them. Um, and also good when coupled with some of the other herbs to combat um, viruses and so forth. This one here, they will happily eat fresh if you've got it in a stable garden, or you can prepare it in an infusion for them. Now, lime blossom. This one here is, I'm going to say, an optional extra in your stable garden. Um, it's a lovely little tree for a bit of shade and it is literally a lime tree. Um, and we're talking about specifically the European lime tree, the Tilia europa. What you're using here is the flower as soon as it has blossomed. So you can potentially get dual use out of this one. If you would like to use limes, you can use the limes at home and you can also harvest the flowers. Just keep in mind um, that the limes come from, you know, the, the flower does its thing and then you get the lime growing. So if you harvest all the flowers, you're not going to get any limes, but it might be the case that you decide to harvest half of the um, flowers and then, you know, the other half can actually be the lime fruit. Um, now, 
In terms of uses, this is really very much about stress and anxiety and blood pressure. So this is going to calm down your really stressed out horse and it's going to reduce their blood pressure if blood pressure is a little bit high. It also assists with fever um, and brings down a fever for a horse that isn't particularly well. So this is one that definitely I can tell you almost 100% you cannot use this one at the time of competition because it really um, is quite a sedating herb, okay? Um, so keep this one in mind, like I said, entirely up to you whether you add this one or not, but it does make a lovely little shade tree and you get the double benefit of the lime. This one, um, the horses aren't just going to eat the flowers off the tree um, in a stable garden, you will have to in, um, do an infusion prepared for the horse. Now the next one, this is actually a really fabulous herb and most people really don't like it. Um, when I talk about nettle, yes, I am talking about stinging nettle and it is a fabulous addition to your herb garden. Now you're not likely to find this one um, at the local stores. Potentially you will find it at um, a herbal uh, specialty store that you can buy them or you might just need to dig this one up um, from your paddock, from a friend's house, from your backyard um, and transplant it or get the seeds and plant it in your garden. The thing about stinging nettle is you don't confuse it with anything else because <laughs> it's one that we all recognise instantly and it's one that we all avoid or we make the mistake of touching it and work out what it is because it does have that horrible sting. Um, the parts that are used are the aerial parts, um, so we're looking at the leaves and the flowers and so forth. Now your horses are obviously not going to eat this fresh because of the sting. But once nettle has dried, the sting is gone and they love it. They really do just hoe into nettle once it has dried off. They think it's absolutely fabulous. Um, it also doesn't have its sting once you've turned it into an infusion, once you've added hot water, that gets rid of the sting. The other great thing about nettle is it's a great companion plant. Bugs don't like it either. So bugs keep away from all your other herbs and leave them alone. They don't eat them. Um, now, if you've got a stable garden where you want your horse to free nibble, uh, you're going to have to keep this to a back corner so that they're happy to eat the other herbs without getting stung um, around the muzzle, obviously. So just think about how you do that. Again, if you really don't like nettle and you just don't want to plant it, you don't have to. Um, you know, <laughs> it's optional. But I really do recommend it because um, this is a great plant for eczema and skin irritations. Now, the horses can eat it and that will help or you can actually turn this into a body wash um, and all you need to do there is pour boiling water over it and then use the water to wash the horse's body. It does work to get rid of eczema and hives and all sorts of skin conditions really, really effectively. It's also useful in treating arthritis and inflammation. It helps to get rid of fluid retention. It's also useful like the other plants um, for bacterial and viral um, problems in the body. If the horse is unwell and they have um, chest congestion, it helps to clear that up. Or if you've got a horse that has a cough, um, it helps to clear up coughs. And on top of that, it has really high nutritional value. It has chlorophyll, iron, chromium, zinc, copper, magnesium, silicon, cobalt, calcium, and vitamins A, C, D, E, and K. So if you're giving vitamin supplements, all of a sudden, uh, you know, the deficiency that you're trying to resolve <laughs> might be gone just with using nettle because it has got such a high nutritive value. Um, and I've spoken about how we can use this and I'll speak about it a little bit more later as well. Okay, so our next plant is peppermint, one that you can fairly, very easily get access to. Um, specifically, you want to get Mentha piperita. There are lots of varieties of peppermint on the market. You can get chocolate peppermint and chili peppermint and all sorts of fancy things. We just want stock standard peppermint, okay? So again, read your labels. What we want to use are the aerial parts. So again, the leaves, the stems, the flowers, all perfectly fine. Horses will very happily munch on peppermint. I know quite a few horses that peppermint is one of their favorites. And it's very, very good for digestive upsets, for colic and ulcers, 
and again stress and anxiety so it's a lot like your lemon balm and your chamomile it deals with the tummy problems it deals with stress and anxiety it's also really useful for horses that get cramps after they've been worked um, so if you give them peppermint regularly it will help to prevent the cramps or you can give them some peppermint um, you know soon after riding to just help keep those cramps at bay um, it's also good for reducing fever and very good in cases of influenza as a supportive herb as well. Um, so peppermint's great because like I said, easy to get your hands on and very effective. They will eat it fresh or you can turn it into an infusion. All right, the next one we've got is rose hip. Very specifically here, what you're wanting to do is find the Rosa canina. This is a specific type of rose that we get the rose hip from. Now your horses aren't likely to just eat the rose hip. You're probably going to have to um, just harvest this one for them. But what they will happily do is eat the leaves off your rose bush. Horses love rose bushes and they especially like them in spring when they're in new shoots and they will just about eat your rose bush to death but thankfully they tend to be hardier than um, what horses can eat them to. Um, so by all means, let them eat the leaves of the plant, not to the point of killing the plant, and then harvest the rose hips. The thing that we use the rose hips for is vitamin C, and that's all, okay? There's a lot of talk about um, you know, using rose hip for arthritis, and yes, it does have an effect on some arthritis. So if you're looking at rheumatoid arthritis, which is considered to be an autoimmune disorder, a lot of studies have found that vitamin C is very effective at managing and treating rheumatoid arthritis. Now there's another body of thought altogether that says, well, autoimmune disorder is rubbish. Why would your body be so stupid as to attack itself? And that there is a viral load present that the body is actually trying to fight, which is causing an inflammatory response. Either way, vitamin C is very good for viruses as well. So regardless of how you think of rheumatoid arthritis, the vitamin C in rose hip can help. But more than that, it's an immune booster. So if your horse isn't well, or if they have poor immune system, vitamin C is gonna give them a boost. Also very good in cases of debility and exhaustion. So it's good for sick horses, but it's also good for geriatric horses. It just gives them that little bit of a boost and keeps their immune systems a bit stronger just in case you know something pops up as it tends to do with old horses. You can feed them the fresh rose hip. You just need to cut out the seed from the inside because it's quite prickly, or you can make it as a decoction. And next we have thyme. Um, now thyme, we're using the aerial parts. They can just nibble away at that quite happily, um, or you can turn it into an infusion. Another one that's really good for poor digestion. Also really good if the horse has a cough and it helps again to combat microbial infections. So that one is very simple very easy to get your hands on but again it's a lovely complementary herb it is also used i haven't added on there um, for parasitic infections so worms again i'm not big fans of thyme um, if you give it to the horse all right harvest and preparation so you've got your list of your nine herbs that you're going to plant now we're going to talk a little bit about what to do next um, what I'm going to do here is I'm going to talk very briefly about how to dry herbs, but not in great detail. And the reason why is because you can find that information online. You can either do it the traditional and natural way, which is to usually to spread the herbs out or to hang the herbs somewhere that's bright and airy and not damp. Or there are lots of people who like to use the oven nowadays to dry their herbs extra fast. Entirely up to you. I tend to prefer traditional, but you know, do what works for you and what works for your lifestyle. Okay, so chamomile. Collect the flowers um, when they're not wet because they can, if you're going to try and dry them, that wet, that damp can cause them to be a little bit mouldy. So in warmer weather is better. As I said, the horses can have them fresh, so you can just throw them into their feed um, or you can dry them at room temperature. Um, if they're eating them fresh, you know, either let them nibble and throw it in their food or you can turn it into an infusion. And again, I'm, I will explain that terminology to you in a moment. 
For dill, like I said, they can happily just eat the leaves, but to get the highest medicinal value, we want the seeds. We're going to collect the seeds when they're brown, and it will be very obvious because the whole inflorescence, so the flower head will kind of go a bit brown and dry, the seeds inside will be brown, and you just shake out those seeds, spread them to dry at room temperature. And this one here, um, look, you can add it to their feed if they will happily take it, or you can um, make it into an infusion. Now the echinacea, um, pick the flowers at any time. If you're going to use the root, you need to dig the root system up in autumn. Um, and what I'd recommend you do is get some seeds from the flower heads if you do that, so that you can replant, reseed them for future use. Echinacea is most effective when it's fresh, um, but you can also dry it at room temperature. Um, if you're using the, if you're not giving it fresh, you can turn the roots into a decoction or the flowers into an infusion. Um, lemon balm, you want to get the um, the flowers, oh, sorry, the aerial parts before the flowers have opened. That's the perfect time when the medicinal value is at its highest. Again, use it fresh, throw it into their feed, or you can hang it to dry and turn it into an infusion. The lime blossom, we're wanting to use the flowers immediately after they have flowered. You don't want to wait for them to get a bit dry and crusty. Fresh, fresh, fresh flowers is what we're wanting. Collect them on a dry day and dry them in the shade, and they can be made into an infusion. The horses aren't going to eat them fresh. Um, you know, there's always the exception, but most likely they're not going to eat a fresh lime blossom. Now the nettle, um, you need to wear gloves so that you don't get stung, but you're wanting to collect the aerial parts when the flowers are blooming. Then what you need to do is dry them in the shade, because like I said, the horses, they will munch into them once they've been dried, or you can infuse them to remove the sting. Um, peppermint, we're collecting the aerial parts before the flowers open and you're using it fresh or you can hang it to dry. So you can throw it into their feed as is or you can make an infusion and add it to their feed. For the rose hips, you're collecting the hips and that's the red fruit in autumn. Um, what you want to do is cut them open. You'll see there's like a prickly seed in there that is not very appetizing at all. Remove that and then the horses will quite often happily eat it fresh um, if you throw it into their feed or you can sun dry them. And you can either make them into a decoction um, or serve them fresh. Um, the thyme, we're collecting the aerial parts in the summer and you can use the thyme fresh or um, you can dry the thyme and in this case they're on a stem so you need to take the leaves off the stem. It's a little bit fiddly but the horses aren't going to be thoroughly impressed if you feed them the stem. Um, so you just have to go to that little bit extra effort um, if you have dried it. If you're feeding the thyme fresh, the stem isn't particularly chewy. They'll be quite happy to eat it, so it's not such a big deal. Oh, and I will go back, sorry, one very quickly. In terms of dosage here, um, what we are doing is you're effectively giving them you know, like a cup of herbal tea. So you're not giving a really high medicinal dose that a herbalist like myself would um, prescribe for your horse because you're obviously doing this at home. It's kind of like, you know, you know you're not feeling that well, so um, you make yourself a cup of peppermint tea or you're feeling a bit wired, so before bed, you're giving yourself chamomile tea. This is effectively what you're doing for your horse. So for each of these, you can quite comfortably give a tablespoon of the herbs um, in the remedies that I'll give you later. So a tablespoon of each herb um, up to three times a day. So you could do it breakfast, lunch and dinner if you see your horse that often or you could give a tablespoon in a morning feed and a tablespoon in the evening feed and you're not going to overdose your horses um, because keep in mind um, that your horse is a lot bigger than we are. So you know the average dose for a human is based on the 70 kilo person. We're talking about horses that are up to 500 kilos. So you can quite safely give them a tablespoon of each herb in the formulations that I give you later. Okay, so I said that I would give you the specifics about how to make um, the dried herbs. If we are going to dry the herbs, I don't ever want you to give them dry. And the reason why is um, you want to sort of rehydrate the herb. So we 
make them into like a tea for the horses. And that's why you have herbal teas. It's not just about being more appetising and that's the way humans like to drink it. Traditionally, it's very much about returning um, the hydration back to the plant so that it is more effective and so that you're releasing the medicinal value from the herbs. So that's why fresh or cup of tea is how you want to go. Um, now, the first thing um, that we'll talk about is a decoction. And I spoke about a decoction when I was talking about some of the herbs. Decoction is used for herbs that are a little bit woody or a little bit stemmy, um, just because they need a little bit more cooking. So what you need to do here is boil the herbs on the stove for 10 to 15 minutes with water added. So, you know, you might have um, a cup of 250 mils of boiling water to your tablespoon of herbs. What you need to do is use a non-metallic container. So you either need to use um, a glass pot if you've got one or some enamel coated cookware. You don't want um, any of your metallic cookwares. And the reason why is the metals actually react with the chemical constituents of the plants and they can render them completely ineffective. So you've wasted your time. Um, the same applies when you're making yourself a cup of tea. Um, you know, pop it in a glass when you're making yourself a cup of tea. Don't um, don't put it into anything metallic. I actually don't even use um, like uh, china or anything like that. I prefer to use glass because I know what's in it. Whereas a lot of your ceramics nowadays will have you know a metallic sort of component to them. When you are making the decoction, keep the lid on the whole time because the evaporation will actually have some of the chemical constituents, some of the essential oils will escape and your cup, um, your decoction won't be as effective. So keep that lid on, but you will need to check every now and then and add more water as needed. Because if you're boiling for 10 to 15 minutes, there will be quite a lot of um, uh, sort of loss. So you just need to keep adding the water. And then once that's done, you can pour the liquid and the herbs into the horse's feet. They'll, they'll eat it as well. Um, you know, we're a bit fussy. We just want a cup of tea without anything added. But you can very happily um, pour the herb in as well for your horses with their feet. Now, the other one is an infusion, and this is literally a cup of tea. So, again, um, pop the herbs into, say, a glass. Add your boiling water, cover and steep for five to 10 minutes. And again, pour the herbs and the liquid into your horse's feed. So I know it's a little bit more effort than just throwing in dried herbs if you are going down the dried herb route, but it is just so much more effective medicinally um, if you do it this way. And that's why I recommend you put in that little bit of extra time. Okay, so here are the remedies. And like I said, um, I've, I've given three lots of remedies here that you'll see. For each of the remedies, they'll have four or five herbs. A tablespoon of each herb um, two to three times a day is perfectly fine. If you only see your horse once a day and you can only feed it once a day, that's fine too. Don't stress yourself out about it. Um, but yeah, that's how I tend to feed it. Spread over the day is a bit better if you can because you'll get um, more value out of it but you get value regardless, feeding it once a day. So the first blend is for stress relief. There are so many stressed horses out there. And obviously, if, the, if your horse is a stress head, have a look at the environmental factors and try and address those environmental factors as a first point of call. But in addition to that, just to help them to calm down, um, I recommend from your herb garden, giving them chamomile, lemon balm, lime blossom and peppermint. Now, if you've decided that you don't want to use the, you know, you don't want to plant a lime tree, you don't want to use the lime blossom, that's fine. This will still be very effective with the chamomile, lemon balm and the peppermint, okay? Um, so that there is a lovely little brand blend. And again, these herbs here are going to help with stomach problems, ulcers. If you've got a stressed out horse that has stomach ulcers, this is a great blend for them as well. Next is our digestion blend. There are so many horses with digestive problems out there. And what we're going to use here is the chamomile, dill, lemon balm, peppermint, and thyme. Um, so this will help um, very much so with the digestion. We're talking about you know pretty much anything that you can think of, whether they've got ulcers, whether they've got scouring, whether they've got a poor appetite. Um, 
whether they have a tendency towards colic and you just want to try and prevent that, this is a really fabulous blend um, to be giving them. Um, as I mentioned before, if you've got um, a young horse, you can just give them the dill and the dill will be very highly effective and it will be very, very safe um, in, a, in quite a young horse. Or if you're feeding a foal that's still um, on milk from the mare, you can give dill to the mare to help support the foal. And our last blend, this is our antimicrobial blend. So if your horse has come down with a bacterial infection or a virus or something along those lines, this is the blend to give them. Um, echinacea, lemon balm, nettle, rosehip and thyme. So this blend has a combination of herbs that um, are antimicrobial in nature. You've got the vitamin C from the rosehip to support the body in fighting um, the infection. And you've got the nettle in there, which has a really high nutritive value. So it's going to be giving them a lot of nutrition. Again, if you really, really, really just don't want to go anywhere near the nettle, not a problem. Again, you're going to have a really good effect if you use echinacea, lemon balm, rose hip, and thyme. Okay. All right. So that is the bulk of what I'm going to be discussing today. Um, I would really love to stay connected with you all and thank you for joining me. Um, I encourage you to all go and have a look at my website, which is sacredhorse.com.au. Um, I have a free um, resource on there, which is a list of herbs to avoid giving to your horse. These are the herbs at the more toxic end of the spectrum, which really should only be prescribed by a herbalist, but I'm seeing them more and more being offered in online stores, which makes me a little bit concerned. Um, so feel free to go and have a look at that resource. Um, I also, obviously, we're leading up to Christmas. I have some specials going at the moment, and I also have some lovely little um, gift ideas and gift vouchers that you can have a look at. Also, um, keep in contact through social media. Um, I have Facebook, Twitter, and Instagram, but I tend to predominantly use Facebook, it's my favourite, um, and you can catch me um, at The Sacred Horse. And I also have a channel on YouTube where I just upload more um, the webinars and those sorts of things um, that I give people free access to. Um, not all of my webinars are free access, but any that are will be um, uploaded onto YouTube, so you can subscribe on that channel as well. Um, so for those of you who are here live, we're going to move to Q&A next. And for anyone who's listening to the replay um, at a later point in time, thank you so very much for joining me and for joining Horse SA who is hosting this today.